Euzu billahi mineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi rabbil alamin. Hamdan katiran tayyiban mubarakan fih. Kema yanbaghi li jalali wajhihi wal azim sultani. Kema tuhibbu ve tarda. Ve salatu ve selamu ala rasulina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecmaîn ve men tabi'ahu bi ihsan ila yevmiddin. سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم سبحانك لا فهم لنا إلا ما فهمتنا إنك أنت الجواد الكريم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد اللهم صل صلاة كاملة وسلم سلاما تاما على سيدنا محمد الذي تنحل به العقد وتنفرج به الكرب وتقضى به الحوائج وتنال به الرغائب وحس الخواتم ويستسقى الغمام بوجهه الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه في كل لمحة ونفس بعدد كل معلوم لك اللهم إنا نسألك الهدى والتقى والعفاف والغنى اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا وقلبا خاشعا ولسانا ذاكرا وشاكرا وتوبة نصوحا اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع وقلب لا يخشع ودعاء لا يسمع وعمل لا يرفع ونفس لا تشبع رب يسر ولا تعسر رب تم بالخير رب زدني علما وفهما وألحقنا بالصالحين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My respected brothers and very respected sisters and all of our brothers and sisters watching us over the internet live Welcome to our Tuesday evening class at the Coburg Islamic Center Melbourne Australia May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our learning a beneficial one. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow the words to enter into our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turn the words into amal and saliha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us, make us of the mukhlasun insha'Allah. We are going through munabbihat al-munabbihat ala al-isti'adad li yawm al-ma'ad li nushi wal-widad by the great Imam Hafiz Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, a booklet attributed to him, which consists of nasiha, advices for those wayfarers who are seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world and hereafter, who wants to understand the spirituality, the deep aspects of the deen. He collected this little booklet into councils and grouped them in the numbers. Councils in twos and threes and fours and fives and until tens. And we have been going through this book for some time now. And we are actually the first page of councils in sixes. So usually the way the book will be organized is starts with some hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam attributed to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and <coughs> some of the companions then some of the Sulaha al Salihin, the next generation and the ulama the time before Ibn Hajar al Asqalani Rahmahullah who were famous in the Muslim world at that time Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith says to us that alaykum bi mujalasati al-ulama wa istima'i kalam al-hukama I urge you to listen and sit in the company of the ulama and give your earnest attention to the wise words of the hukama, the wise ones for verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revives the dead hearts through by means of their words like he revives a dead land, barren land through the agency of ma il matar the, 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 the rain water. So we need this for our hearts to kick start. We are in the month of Rajab, the holy month of Rajab, and we are just in the corner of Sha'ban. 
And Ramadan is just around the corner for us to prepare ourselves, inshallah ta'ala, towards that beautiful month of Ramadan. We need the nasiha more than every day. Last week, we did not have a class because we had a youth camp we had to attend. After a week's absence, alhamdulillah, we are back on the track. And we are on page 66. We should have some copies. If you don't have any copies, I think uh, our technical staff, they went downstairs to get some copies for you. We went through the first hadith last time, in our last lesson, where, just for quick revision, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said to us, قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ستة أشياء هن غريبة في ستة مواضع المسجد غريب فيما بين قوم لا يصلون فيه والمصحف غريب في المنزل قوم لا يقرؤون فيه والقرآن غريب في جوف الفاسق والمرأة المسلمة الصالحة غريبة في يد رجل ظالم سيء الخلق والرجل المسلم الصالح غريب في يد امرأة ودية سيئة الخلق العالم غريب بين قوم لا يستمعون إليه ثم قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الله تعالى لا ينظر إليهم يوم القيامة نظر الرحمة حفظنا الله وإياكم صدق رسول الله فيما قال أو كما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم said six things are strangers absolute strangers in or among six situations a masjid, a mosque, is a stranger among people, Muslims, who do not attend to that masjid, who do not go and pray in it. It's a gharib, stranger. The Qur'an is a stranger in a home, in a household, where it is just kept on the shelves and not read. Third, the memorized Qur'an is a stranger in the heart of a fasiq, non-practicing Muslim. Allah gave him the blessing of memorizing the whole Qur'an when he was young. But he has forgotten. He does not practice. He does not follow. This Qur'an is a prisoner, stranger in the heart of that sinful Muslim. Then Rasulullah says, a righteous Muslim woman is a stranger in the hands of an oppressive husband of an absolute rotten character, bad akhlaq. Similarly, Rasulullah says, a pious muttaqi Muslim man is a stranger in the hands of an evil wife of bad character. Then finally Rasulullah says, number six, an alim, Islamic scholar, is a stranger amongst a group of people who do not listen to them or listen to him. An alim is a stranger amongst a group of people who do not listen to him. This includes his own family in a different hadith his own family or his closest friends who do not understand him, who do not listen to him because familiar <laughs> familiarity breeds contempt. Then Rasulullah said, Verily, indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at them, these six groups of people, on the Day of Judgment in a merciful manner. What you need on the Day of Judgment more than everything else is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody enters into Jannah because of their good deeds. Get into your heads. 
everybody enters into Jannah because of the Rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will never and ever and ever and ever be able to pay back what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us as in terms of ni'mah. We would never. Everybody enters into Jannah because of the mercy, rahmah, blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forgive beyond our understanding. So much so, the hadith tells us, even shaitan alayhi lana will have a hope. He says, me too, me too, me too. Can I also get like, be included amongst the blanket, this rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives? He will not be forgiven, of course. Actually, there are quite a few hadith of Prophet sallallahu which gives certain groups, examples of certain groups who shall never, never enter Jannah, never see the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will go to Jahannam first if they are Muslims, then maybe attended to Jannah afterwards. For example, he says, Namam. Rasulullah says, Jannah's fragrance could be smelled, the scent of Jannah could be smelled from 500 years distance. Everybody can smell, except four groups of people, he says in one hadith, for example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment will not look at them with nadarul rahmah, with the merciful look. Who are they? Namam, he says. First, those people who are termed as gossip mongers. The people who take your word and, as a gossip and take it somewhere else, add, add, add some stuff onto it, and so that your friendship, muhabba, ukhuwa is broken. The, the tie between families are broken. All they do is carry juicy bits from one people to another. He said this, she said this, he said this, she said this. Absolutely haram. Gossip mongering. Rasulullah says, first group will be this one. Aqul walidain. Another one. He says, those people who disobey their righteous parents. They ask them to do things. But the children disobey. These children will never even smell the fragrance of Jannah. Something that can be smelled from 500 years distance. Mudminul khamr. Rasulullah says, A person who is an alcoholic, who drinks alcohol as a habit, and he doesn't want to give up. He knows that he's sinning, he accepts his sin, but he still doesn't give up. Mudminul khamr. An alcoholic person will also be in the same boat. In the fourth one, Rasulullah Sallallahu says, at the youth. The youth is a person who does not feel, feel any ghayra, any form of jealousy. If somebody looks at his wife, his daughters, with an ill intention, definitely lustful eyes, and he just closes his eyes and he thinks that it's okay, my wife and the daughters are attractive and they are looking at them. This person is a person called a youth, which is absolutely haram to be. On the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at them with nazarul rahmah. There are quite a few hadith as such. So in this one, Rasulullah sallam refers to six groups of people. First one, the people who live around the masjid and yet they don't attend the masjid. Because masjid is a stranger. I'mar, I'mar is building a masjid. That's literal meaning of the word. But I'mar in, uh, in the sense of a hadith, in the Islamic sense, is the person who builds the masjid, keeps the masjid alive by going to the masjid on a regular basis. Otherwise, if you build the best masjid, the best mosque with the most expensive decor, in the best possible place, in the heart of the city, but it has no attend attendees, or no jama'ah, no congregation, that masjid is a stranger. Although a Muslim knows that having a masjid nearby makes it compulsory for him to attend for every salat that he, while he's in that suburb, while he's in that household, he needs to go and attend that masjid. His salat will not be accepted otherwise. 
as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, a person who fails to attend Fajr as well as Isha, these are the most convenient times for most people to attend the masjid because they need to. During the day they might be working somewhere else. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, <coughs> these two salats are the most difficult salats for the munafiqeen, hypocrites. Since we don't have any hypocrites in this day and age, because nobody's afraid anymore of not being a Muslim. Not being a Muslim. In the olden days, during the time of Rasulullah, even the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, used to attend the masjid five times a day with the fear that if they do not, the community, the Muslim community, will exorcise them, will excommunicate them, will completely expel them from amongst themselves and brand them as munafiqeen. So, in the olden days, they used to attend the masjid because of fear. And Rasulullah used to say, the most difficult salat to attend for a munafiq who does not have iman in his heart. And yet he says he's a Muslim. He just wants to fit in. He's on the ride with everybody else. He's on the bus with everybody else, but and yet he's a kafir. He says, most difficult salat for these people are Fajr and Isha salat. A Muslim this day and age, if he's not going to the Salat, forget about being munafiq. He's definitely a fasiq, a transgressor who openly sins without any shame. A man's place not in the house to pray. A man's place is in the masjid. He needs to. If he's next to a masjid, he must attend the jama'ah in congregation. Unless he has about 19 different excuses, which according to our fuqah books, listed, and believe me, none of them applies to you. None of them applies to you. And if you need to, I can go through with you. However, a Muslim must attend the masjid. A Muslim cannot be crossed with the masjid because you don't like the committee, because they're Albanians, or they're Pakistani, they're Turks, or Lebanese. They are who filthy, filthy, such and such. Or they are so dishonored, corrupt, such and such. That's none of your business. Masjid is a masjid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Committee is a committee of the human beings. So you need to attend the masjid regardless. Don't get involved with the politics of the masjid, but you cannot be cross with the masjid. If you do, you are leaving the masjid in a position where on the day of judgment that masjid will be complaining against you, suing against you on the day of judgment. Gharib, stranger, with the head down, waiting. What's the use of building a big building, brick and mortar, if there is nobody to attend to a masjid? If you go to masjid every step of the way, every time, without failure, your, your daraja, your rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases. You get one hasana, you get one sin removed from your sin, the sin book. You are elevated in the, in the, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the masjid. Whether you go by car, or by bicycle, or walk, doesn't matter. You still get the same hasanat. This is our deen. We need to attend our masjid. Masjid has to be part of our lives. We have to be masjid-centric people. Masjid-centric people. What does that mean? Masjid has to be the hub of every activity that we have. It's a place where we get married. It's a place where we celebrate things. It's a place where we get together and decide on things. It's a place where we come to worship in, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Masjid is the center of Muslims. Our children have to learn the value of masjid. But how in the world we're going to teach our children? Oh, that's a masjid. Look, from a distance. Children will never learn. They need to come and attend the masjid with you for Fajr, for Isha, for Dhuhr and Asr during the weekends. Maghrib to the best of your ability. But masjid has to be part and parcel of a Muslim's life. Whatever activity that you're doing, it has to emanate from the masjid. You're like a compass that you draw circles with. The constant leg of the compass has to be the masjid. All the other activities has to be from the masjid. You cannot have Islam, you cannot have da'wah, you cannot have jama'ah if you're not, not based in a masjid. It has to be masjid. Rasulullah's life was the masjid. 
His state, Islamic state was from the masjid. His armies were organized from the masjid. Marriages were done in the masjid. Janazah was done in the masjid. Masjid is such an important part of a Muslim's life. I, cannot, I, can, I can tell you it is more important than your own homes where you go and sleep and try to relax at home. In the sight of a true Muslim, Masjid is very central. And in the life of a true Muslim, Masjid is the, the happiest being, inanimate being in the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the places Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves most are the masajid. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates those aswaq, the souq, the marketplaces, where lots of lying, lots of cheating, lots of taking oaths are taking place. People are too busy with dunya and they forget about the masajid. Masajid is our heart. Masajid is our home. We need to give due rights to the masjid. We need to learn the adab of masjid. We need to learn how to enter into masjid, how to come out of the masjid, how to conduct ourselves within the masjid. Masjid is the holiest place on every part of the world. We need to understand this. Otherwise, these masajid will be complaining against us on the day of judgment. Hafizan Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at with nazar al-rahmah, merciful look as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says. Quran is exactly the same thing. Quran is here for to be read, to be followed as a book of guidance, as a human user manual, not a book that you put in the most expensive covering and put it in the best, the loftiest place, the most exalted place in your rooms, bedrooms. And each time, even if you pick it up every day and <coughs> 10 times, million times, a day, if you were to kiss it and show your respect towards the Qur'an like that, it will not help you. Qur'an is to be read. Noble reading. Qur'an means noble reading. Qur'an al kareem If you're not reading, if you're 60 years old, 70 years old, still do not know how to read Qur'an, but you've learned every possible language on earth, you learned every possible taxation law, Every possible that is beneficial to this world and you did not learn Quran and you come with the flimsies of excuses that I don't know how to read Quran because it's difficult, you're a liar. You can learn anything. One of the most mu'jizawi, miraculous aspect of the Quran is that anybody and everybody can learn Quran with the easiest possible way. That's how Quran is. But you need to have the right intention. There is no such thing as you cannot read Quran. Every Muslim can read Quran. And just reading Quran, no. The purpose of reading Quran, if you just read, yes, you'll get hasanat for it. Just for reading. But the purpose of Quran is to be understood, to be applied, to be implemented in our daily lives. That's what the Quran is for. Otherwise, what would Quran was sent? If it was going to be read in the most melodious voice, it's like receiving a letter from a king. And the king asks you, commands you, decrees that you should do such and such and such and such and such. He's asking you to do certain things and keep away from certain things. And he says, I'll give you this much time. At the end of this time, I will want all of these things. And you love the king's letter so much. You show it to everybody. You're so proud of the king's letter that you receive personally. And you read it with the most perfect English or in our case, perfect Arabic, with the most melodious voice, and yet, you ignore the contents of it. You even teach your children how to read it melodiously. And your family members, you so religiously follow this letter, not in the, what the word of the letter is, but you just recitation of it. This will not help you. Quran is a human user manual. We need to learn. If your parents did not teach you, you need to make an effort yourself. I don't understand Arabic, read it from English. Get the message, understand the meaning of it. Once, twice, three times, ten times. Once you read the ma'ani, once you read the translation of it, then you can go to basic tafsir books. There are so many of them. If you don't know, just come to me. I'll direct you, point you. 
I'll give you proper references inshallah. You will learn. But you need to learn this. This is your book. Otherwise, Quran will be just a book of ceremony. Like the Bible is. Or like the other Torah is. Or the previous books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran is never a book of ceremony. We don't read Quran just in our weddings, in our engagement parties, in our kitab in kitabs in our, in, our, in, our, in our gatherings of what you call annual general meetings. Quran is not for this purpose. Quran is to be followed as a guidance. Quran is something that is very important to us. Otherwise, Quran is a stranger in the community where it is not read or read for the wrong purpose or just read in a passion in, in, a, in a parrot fashion and just read and read and read without being understood Quran is a stranger in the same household Quran is a stranger a Quran in the heart of a munafiq heart in the, in the, in the, in the heart of a fasik person who, was, who learned when he was young but that, that did not practice does not follow does not follow those teachings of the Quran is as indeed a strange, a gharib. Allah will not look at this person with that favorable mercy of Rahmah or the eyes of Rahmah. Righteous men and righteous women and righteous Muslim and Muslima, both cases, whose akhlaq is so bad, who is a fasiq, either man or woman, is the biggest person. Rasulullah says, he, he, he who gives his pure daughter to somebody who is rich and powerful and yet and yet fasiq no religion he has betrayed the trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given that person betrayed the trust of that woman that nisa that girls that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him as an amanah to look after and settled them with righteous people or vice versa for that matter because oh she's my cousin third removed because she's gorgeous oh we love each other get lost People do not live with love, uh, what do you call fresh and love, the, the love and fresh air. You need to live with the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When all said and done, once the beauty is gone, once the lust is gone, what remains is the akhlaq, what remains is the Islamic personality, what remains is the deen with the person. That's why Rasulullah says, when you give your daughters, make sure that person has the highest degree of akhlaq. He has taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he will treat your daughter with utmost respect because he fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he does not, because his akhlaq is bad, he does not fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his attitude, his akhlaq is rotten, his character is spoiled, that person will make this dunya, which is already a sijin to a salih muslim, a salih muslima, this will become even worse. So we need to be careful. So such persons in the wrong hands, wrong compatibility ratio, wrong, wrong marriages can sometimes be prison for life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to make the right choices inshallah for ourselves and for our daughters and sons and our siblings inshallah ta'ala. <coughs> and finally, an alim, an Islamic scholar is a stranger amongst a group of people who do not listen to him. An alim, a person who studies for years, he studies for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An alim, a scholar is useless if he cannot teach this knowledge, if he cannot pass this knowledge on to people who would take it from him. An alim's function is to be a vicegerent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. His function is to be warathatul anbiya a representative of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi on earth. What does Allah and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi represent on earth? The path of Allah, the Sharia, the Deen, Deen al-Islam. If he's there and nobody takes it from him, you have just killed that person's purpose, function. I give this example sometimes. People laugh at, but it is true. It's like a Ferrari. Latest model, the most expensive, top of the range, with all the extras in it, is used as a chicken pen in the backyard. 
the purpose of the Ferrari is not to be used as a chicken house. It is used for some other purpose. And ask the young people, they will tell you what the purpose is. Sure, they know the value of Ferrari. They say, it's wrong, man. What are you doing, man? This is no good, man. What are you doing? An old man is driving a Ferrari? No good. What does he know? Because he's doing 40 on a highway. Because he's driving a Ferrari, it doesn't mean that it's anything. Even then, you cannot under, we, can, we, we find it wrong. An alim, his function is to change the community. He's the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth, as well as representative of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His office, he's there to change and save your akhirah. He's there to share Quran, teach Quran to you. Teach the haqq and truth, khair to you. But if there is nobody to take it from him, especially the people who grew up with him and who treat him like a friend, and they never understand his value, his own family, you have just killed that person, absolutely. If you do not know the adab towards the ulama, if you do not know the adab towards our Islamic scholars, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help you. Especially you begin to make jokes with him, and you talk behind his back, which is poison, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, will kill you. When you begin to talk about the ulama, you are playing with fire. You talk behind his back, you make his ghiba, you talk about his shortcomings, personal shortcomings to other people, and you make this a gossip the, the, the subject, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help you. Uh, ulama are human beings, but they are the ones through by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserves this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the ulama do not exist, which is the son of the, one of the signs of Qiyamah, Rasulullah sallam says, the sa'a, the day of judgment will not occur until ilm is completely removed from the people. They said, how ya Rasulullah, Allah will snatch the ilm knowledge from the hearts of the people? He says, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one by one will take the lives of the ulama, Islamic scholars, and there will not be anybody to replace them. And they will go then, the people will go and ask their polit politicians or leaders for fatwa about the fard, about what to do, what is haram and what is halal. And those politicians will give fatwa according to their whims and wishes. Then they themselves, the, the ones who give fatwa will go to Jahannam and those people who follow them will also end up in Jahannam. One alim, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, as an adversary, as an enemy to shaitan, he is more formidable than 1,000 abideen, devout worshippers. The function of an alim is to speak. The function of an alim is to teach. Function of an alim is to show the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that function is taken away from him, then that ummah is doomed. The reason why we are in this rot as a community, as an ummah, because we have lost our ulama. We have lost the prestige once our ulama had over this ummah, where we were at the highest, at the height of our civilization, the ulama, that prestige is gone. And our ulama are few and far in between, very seldom found. And even if we recognize them, we fail, we fall short in our behavior towards them or in our respect towards them. We do not sit with them, we do not learn from them, and we do not take heed from the things they teach us. Hafizan Allahu ayyakum. One of the signs of Qiyamah. So an alim, scholar, amongst people who do not listen, is a stranger. On the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to not look at Muslims in that such manner. During the last period of the Ottoman Empire, when Dajjal Ataturk, when he closed, when he declared republic, and closed all the madaris. Islamic education was forbidden. Islamic education of any kind was forbidden. All the tekkas and zawiyas were shut down. All the ulama by the dozen, every day, dozens of them every day, were slaughtered. They were hung in the public places to teach religion, which was taken for granted for centuries. 
became such a dangerous game that if you are caught, you will definitely lose your life. If anybody even used the word Allah, were put into jail, Adhan was turned into Turkish language. People are not going to masjid, they're scared. Anybody who is of any of religious practice are arrested because they thought Islam was the cause of our backwardness according to their thinking. Therefore they need to eradicate Islam from the hearts and minds of people. They went through this process for years, for 18 years in the land of Turkey now. Adhan was in a different language, not in the Adhan. There was no Muhammad Rasulullah. There was no Allah. There was no La ilaha illallah. It was all in Turkish language. It was the most ridiculous practice, but they did it for 18 years. During those times, certain ulama, they know this value. They have this amana. They need to pass this on to the next generation by all means possible, by hook or crook, as they say. They had to do it. And certain students who are going through their education, all of a sudden, you go to university, for example, tomorrow, police is there, the army is there. They say, there's no more university, go home. All the professors, can you imagine? All the students, can you imagine what will happen to them? Finished, khalas. They change the language, they change the script. The language that, you, that we used to write with, the Arabic Quranic script, is changed into Latin. Everybody who used to, used to know how to read and write, all of a sudden became illiterate overnight. Can you imagine? You go to school next week, and by law, the parliament decided that we're going to use, as Australians, we're going to use Japanese script in our language and speak English, but write everything in Japanese. And you've got no idea what Japanese script is. What will happen to your education? What will happen to Australia? Australia will go back 70 years at least. Three generations minimum before you can actually begin to begin to come up with something again. All our book, books will be absolutely useless. One particular person I met personally, he says, for he, a very elderly person, he was crying at the same time. He says, during those years, my brother, he says, during those years, I worked in a public bath, the biggest Turkish bath in Istanbul at that time, where thousands of people used to come every morning to take shower, because it's a big city. He says, for five to eight years, we did not burn anything. It was a 24-hour furnace. 24 hours, he says, we used to burn handwritten Islamic books as fuel to fire those big urns, big hot water tanks. Islamic books handwritten from libraries upon libraries upon libraries was all Islamic books, fiqh books, hadith books, Quran, all into the fire to be burned. This was the butchery. This was the zulim oppression of that time. Can you imagine teaching Islam to anybody? So one particular Shaykh says, my teacher, I was in my third year, fourth year of my Islamic studies, I've got another four years to go maybe. He says, I don't know what to do. And we went to the madrasa the following day, uh, police was there. He says, you can't study anymore, go home. We went home, what do I do? I was destined to be an alim, I was destined to be a scholar because that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years of my life. I, I was chosen, sponsored for this job. That's how the community chose me. He says, so I went home and I asked, what shall I do? I was advised to go and work in the farm of the parents. What is the farm? They've got wheat farm. they the fields upon fields of the wheat. So what do you do? You have to plow the land behind an ox or a couple of oxes or horses. And you go through the plowing in the, in the morning, in that particular period, that, that particular season. He says, one day, the alim, the greatest scholar of our time at that time, he says, we used to go and sit in his presence with barakah, with tabarrukah. We used to sit down and learn for hours, he says. Thousands of, students, thousands of students he had. This person, that it was such an honor for us to attend to his majlis. 
his gathering, he was such an alim, he says, one day I saw him walking towards a field in plain clothes. Not that he's taking his imam off. He's just wearing a jubba, black jubba that everybody wears. He came into the mud, he says, and gave salams. My parents are there and we are looking at each other. What is he doing here? If the police saw us, we're in trouble. He said, my son, I came to help you. He's elderly, he's got a beard. He says, we began to walk. He's holding behind an ox with me. After we walked for 10, 100 meters, he took the book out from his pocket. He says, my son, you need to finish this. If I don't want to leave this world without passing this responsibility on to you. He says, you need to finish your ilm. You need to finish your education. He says, repeat after me. Come on, repeat after me. Repeat after me. He says, for three and a half, four years, he says, we did this together. And he made sure that I, he passed this knowledge on to me before he passed away. Ulama. Perhaps at that time, they had no option because they were under subjugation and under, under despotic rule of the governments of that time. Muslim world went through this, still going through in certain areas. But in our case, in our case, the function of the ulama is to teach the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our parents save our children from this worldly life, the difficulties of this life. We want them to get good education. We want them to get good jobs. We want them to get married to good children, good salia wives and husbands, so they can be comfortable in this life as much as possible. But our ulama, according to our ulama again, they have more haq, more rights on us than our parents. Why is that so? Because our parents save our lives, our dunya, our ulama, ulama al-haq, the true representatives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they save our akhirah. They save us from eternal condemnation into Jahannam. They save our imans. We can never, we can never, and we can never pay back what is due to our ulama, the people who teach our deen. So you need to be extremely careful in terms of your duties towards the ulama. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah allow us to have that adab towards our ulama and know the ni'mah if there is one living in your area or if you are in a country where there are lots of ulama for you to be in their majlis and learn from them this deen that is passed through all the chains of ulama through that silsila system that we have that deen is passed on to you through this ulama the agency of this ulama may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be one of those lucky ones who know the value of our ulama otherwise on the day of judgment Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at you in a merciful manner. In the next hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, قَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ سِتَّةُ لَعْنَتُهُمْ وَلَعْنَهُمُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى وَكُلُّ نَبِيٍ مُجَابِ الدَّعَوَاتِ الزائد في كتاب الله تعالى ومكذب بقدر الله تعالى والمتسلط بالجبروت ليعز ليعز من أذله الله ويذل من أعزه الله والمستحل لحرم الله تعالى والمستحل من عترتي ما حرم حرم الله والتارك التارك لسنتي فإن الله تعالى لا ينظر إليهم يوم القيامة نظر الرحمة نظر warning from رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم says there are six types of people whom I have cursed and Allah has cursed. Subhanallah. Have you ever heard Rasulullah cursing anybody? Look, he says, there are six types of people I have cursed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also cursed. And of course, the dua, the supplication of every Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is 100% accepted. 
if Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi curses you, what will happen to you? Do you have any chance? Manifta bi ghayri ilmin, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, he who, he who gives fatwa without knowledge, knowledge is qala Allah, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, faqad. May Allah and the Malaikas curse be upon that person. In the hadith, I can show you. You know the famous hadith, majority of us know. May Allah have, may Allah's curse be upon the person, or the Malaikas curse be upon the person. Women who pluck their eyebrows, who file their teeth, who put tattoos, not women only, put tattoos on their bodies. Or two, if there are men, try to look like women, and the ones who look like who are women try to look like men. Some words Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam uses curse again to change what Allah subhanahu wa taala created. Here, this is not part of the ones I just said, but this is a new group altogether. Six of them, may Allah and Rasuls curse be upon such person. Definitely the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Nabi Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will be 100% accepted. Who are these? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, He who adds anything to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean bro? Every Muslim knows that we can never take anything from the book of Allah and you cannot add anything onto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book. You bet. You haven't been reading internet? You haven't heard of progressive Muslims? You haven't heard any academic modern Muslims? Who want to be reinterpreted? The Quran has to be reinterpreted. There is no such thing as ayah which says that you must cover. It's all the concoction of the ulama. Allah doesn't say so. We don't need any, any interpretation of men to tell us what Quran is. There is no such thing as hadith. Hadith is just a concocted sayings of people, generation after generation. Only the Quran and the literal words of Quran. And it must be rewritten in the language that people understand according to the Western standards of thinking. I've heard this many a times. I still do. What are these people doing? Change the laws of jihad. Excuse me. Change the laws of drinking. Change the laws on gay marriages. Change the laws on... You name it. Because they are all outdated. We need a modern interpretation of the Quran. What are these people doing? Adding things or taking things out of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَنْ قَالَ بِالْقُرْآنِ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said He who speaks on the Qur'an without knowledge let him prepare his eternal abode eternal address eternal home in the fire of Jahannam, Rasulullah says, Who are you to interpret the Quran for me? You don't even know anything about Quran. You can't even read the Quran. Oh, female imam, a lady in US, in Canada, read Salatul Jum'ah. She was the imam, and many modernist Muslims, about 12 of them, prayed behind her, and it was the best Jum'ah. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Make my day. Yeah, sure. Does that change the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Definitely not. You mean all of a sudden you are the most wisest Muslim, most intelligent Muslim discovered? This particular ayah, actually there are several ayahs in the Quran about the hijab, covering of the women. And the Muslims for the last 1400 years, including Salafus Salihin, including the companions, including Rasulullah's own wives, and aunts and uncles, the families, 
they were all wrong and you are right okay you, I can understand how angry you're getting upset you're getting the other day I was invited to a particular place a mahfil a gathering of some traditional Muslims there was one rich man I'm not going to mention who he is but he's very well known in our community he is sitting you know they gave him the best seat in the house the only reason is that because he's loaded with cash nothing else worthless in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why am I saying this? I never say this about anybody. For some reason, the topic turned into discussion of zakat. And he was pushing the idea that why should we pay zakat in this day and age? Zakat is outdated. We pay taxes to the government, therefore that's enough. And some Muslims were saying, mm hmm those who are saying the head like this become kafir at the same time with him because he is changing the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making what is haram into halal halal into haram you with me? anybody who adds or takes away from any of the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adds on to the book of Allah or takes it away from in through the process of making halal into haram or haram into halal this is kufr. This is not Islam. Although I am risking my life for this one, I'm going to tell you. I'm on a very high at the moment. In Medina al Munawwara, oh, all right, I won't mention the names of the Qurra. One of the very popular Imams of Masjid al Nabawi. About four years ago, he delivered a khutbah against the Zionism and against the atrocities of the U.S. foreign policy. I'm not saying any names, I said. He was immediately removed from his job. He lost his job for four years. When the new king came, the kingdom changed, the new king came. He went and begged them literally. And eventually he put back, reinstated last year. I'm hearing this. I didn't know anything about this. I'm hearing this from one of the Mujabir, one of the people, Ahlul Madina. He lives there for the last 35 years or so. One old uncle. He says, Mahmoud, you don't know what's happening to us. What's, what's happening to you? You are in the heartland of Islam. He says, no, that's what you think. How? He says, do you know when the Gaza incident happened, not this time, the other time before, they went, the Zionist army went and destroyed so many Muslims. He says, we used to make qunut, even after Asr, in our local masjid, in Medina. Imam used to make qunut, we used to make qunut, ameen, ameen, cursing, cursing. Yahud, la'natullah ala Yahud. Zionists and what have you. He says, all of a sudden, <laughs> we, we get, we're getting hyped up. He says, all of a sudden, no more. We went to the Sheikh, he said, what happened here, Sheikh? How come we're not making a dua? He says, look, from the Ministry of Aqaf, he says, we're forbidden to say those things anymore. Illegal. Ya Latif. Then you know what else he said? He says, no more. We're allowed to read any of the ayat which contains anything that advises you to join the jihad. Any jihad words. Anything to do with uh, what do you call putting down, so to speak, Ahlul Kitab. Nasara or Yahud. He said, how could this be? He says, because one day they were watching on television. On television. Who's watching? Mr. Bush, the former. And he's reading the translation of the Qur'an at the same time. The certain verses in the Surah of the Ali Imran. He said, what is this? Excuse me, king, my friend. What's this, man? I thought you loved us. You hate us? Don't get these people in the minds of people. Take these ayats from the Qur'an. Don't let them read publicly. 
He says that day onwards, we are not allowed to read any of those ayats, ayats, except in Ramadan because we do khatam anyway. Only in Ramadan, in public television. Any other time, he says it's illegal for us to read those ayats. Not as, in, as individuals, as the imam in the salat for Maghrib and Isha and Fajr. So who's changing what? <coughs> who's changing what? Anybody who changes anything from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes it out, takes it out or adds on to it, may Allah's curse be upon such people, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says. I am not mentioning any individuals. I am mentioning mentality. So one group I mentioned is the modernist, modern Muslims, progressive Muslims they call themselves. Modern and progressive Muslims they call, they call themselves. And the other ones are of course the secularists. The nationalists against their national agenda, they change everything. So we need to be aware. There's just one interpretation. A Muslim who denies even a letter from the Quran, a word from the Quran, is not a Muslim. That's a aqidah. Quran is absolutely perfect, intact. You cannot take one word, one letter out of the Quran. It is all in there. You have to accept it as whole, as a whole, without questioning. It is from Rabbil Alameen. If you take it, even if you take, I believe in all the surahs except this particular ayah, because your puny little mind doesn't understand it, you have a problem, yes, we can fix that problem for you. But if you adamantly argue that this ayah I cannot take, then you are not a Muslim. Even if you pray, not five times a day, 50 times a day, you are not a Muslim. Because there is something wrong with your aqidah. Your ship is sinking. It has a big hole right at the bottom of the ship. You're gone. Now, second man Rasulullah says, He who disbelieves in the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We went and explained qadr many a times. It is the blueprint for creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qadar we are not allowed to question. Qadar is something that happens to us. Our duty is to have the right attitude towards Qadar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We did not have any choice in choosing our parents. We did not have any choice in choosing ourselves. We did not choose our friends. We did not choose our relatives. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chosen for us. The, the, the time of our place of birth, we did not choose. The time where we're going to die, we did not choose. The wife that we're going to get married, and the children we're going to have, it's all chosen for us. It's a taqdeer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But your attitude towards this taqdeer is the most important thing. If you deny the taqdeer, qadr, you don't become a Muslim. You're not a Muslim. Qadr is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's part of amantu billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi. وَرُسُلِهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَبِالْقَدَرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ مِنَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى I believe in the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Evil of it or good of it is all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is my attitude towards qadr? If my qadr, through the qadr, not my, in my control, it, if something bad, something that seemingly sharr comes towards me, my obligation, my duty is to have the attitude of sabr towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qadr. If you are diagnosed with some disability, some sickness, some incurable disease beyond your control, nobody has it in the community, one in a million. And yet, what do you do? You go in denial, you say, no, I don't accept this, I can't, it can't, it can't be happening to me, I'm losing all my hair, I'm losing everything in my body, I'm losing this, I'm losing this. You can scream and crave, whatever you want to do, but it will never change the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will happen. A good Muslim who believes in the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, taqdeer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the one who says, amanna wa saddaqna. This is from, hadha min Allah. Ya Rabbi, please give me patience. Ya Rabbi, let me, ya Rabbi give me hasanat for enduring this. If it's something ni'mah, all of a sudden, your luck, there is no such thing as luck, changes. And you came into such a ni'mah, such a ni'mah beyond your dreams. You have your dream, everything. Then your duties, again part of the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khayrihi wa sharri, khayr. 
then your duty is to make shukr towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the attitude of a Muslim. We don't have anything else. Anything else outside this will take you in the danger zone. What is the danger zone? If you do not accept qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll be complaining about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qadr. Then therefore you're endangering your iman, your yaqeen in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you do not make shukr to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you through qadr, you also fall short towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of your, your adab, in terms of your ibadah towards him, because you don't recognize the ni'mah that is coming from you, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As simple as this. Qadr. But if you turn around and change, why does this happen to me? I never forget the day. I, I still, each time I remember, I get my hairs stand on my the, the skin. I get the, the shivers. One particular sister. MashaAllah. Wife of a doctor. One of the little girls, one of her daughters. Halima. You don't know them, so I mentioned the name, forget about it, nobody knows. Fictitious name, Halima. She did something wrong, the child. A child of five years old will do lots of wrong things, because that's what is expected of them. You know what she was saying to the child? What did I deserve to get this from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What did I do to deserve you? I mean, what did I do to deserve you as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Child is a ni'mah. Child is one of the greatest ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many people go to so much length if they can't have children. The other day I met one sister, I still remember. Ya Allah, they came for counseling. Ya Allah, she went for IVF program nine times. Nine times, which is above the legal limit. Because they can afford it, they paid. She can't have any children, she's dying to have children. And this one says, what did I deserve you? Why, do I, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me you to the child? What is she doing? Oh Allah, you are wrong in your qadr, in your planning, in your taqdeer. You made a mistake by giving this child to me. That's what she's saying. That's why my hair stood on end on the back of me. Oh my skin, I can still feel it. I said, Ya Rabbi, something's going to happen now. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to punish us. Because she is blaspheming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not say such things. Everything is a blessing. Sometimes blessing in disguise. Sometimes such a khair that it looks like sharr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, there are certain things that you perceive to be bad for you, in fact it's good for you. And sometimes you think that you want it so much, it's so good for you, you think in essence, in fact, it is actually bad for you. Bad for you. So we don't know what is khayr for us, what is shar for us. In the taqdeer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, overall plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're not allowed to even discuss qadr in detail because we'll never understand the overall plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't know. We might judge something to be bad for us, something even haram and terrible and terrible, but and yet it could be something completely different. The classic example, Allah teaches us this particular lesson to us in the story of Khidr and Musa alayhi salam. We don't understand. Musa alayhi salam thinks like us. He says, why? Why did you kill the child? Why did you do this? You sink the ship. Why did you do this? Why did you do this? Why did you do this? Khidr says, shh, don't ask questions. Yeah, certain qadr, we say, we do not questions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our attitude towards us is the most important thing for us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshaAllah allow us to be good Muslims inshaAllah whose iman and yaqeen in qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is intact. Thirdly, he who oppressively uses his power to elevate those whom Allah has brought low and to bring low those whom Allah has elevated. You help the people who hate Allah. You help the people, you are in a position of power. You help the munafiqeen to have their way. You help the people who hate Allah and His Rasul through your money, through your power, through your position to become, they get the public 
platform to say whatever you want. In other words, you fail in al amr bil ma'roof wa nahi al munkar, and you allow these people to come to the front and influence the society, influence the young minds. Then, in this case, you have what you have lowered down what Allah subhanahu wa taala held up high, or vice versa. Allah lowered them. They are the scum of this earth. They are the worst of mankind. Balhum adal, as Allah subhanahu wa taala says, lower than the animals. And you wanted to bring them because your heart is also diseased. There is one particular hadith that I always, always keep it right between the smack of my eyes. This is to do with learning, ilm. Because only through ilm a human being can realize his potential. Through ilm. Ilm al nafi'ah. Not information, ilm. Otherwise, there is no difference between us and the other animals. Even sometimes worse. Have you seen on the side of Sydney Road? An old man, probably he was a manager of a certain big company with a brown bag, a bottle in his hand. He's going like this. He lost everything. You never see a pig doing that or a donkey doing that. That's what happens when you lose the path. When you lose the path. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says This dunya is cursed everything is cursed it has no value in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except for groups of people Don't be of the fifth one he says immediately don't be of the fifth one because you shall be destroyed with the dunya How what are these four things He says be an alim scholar in the sight of Allah that's the highest we cannot be Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, impossible, because Anbiya is chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But ulama, you can work. Everybody has a potential. Every man and woman, talabul mus- ilm, fariratun ala kulli muslimin wa muslimatun Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says. Seeking of the Islamic knowledge is fard upon every Muslim and Muslima, male and female Muslims. Not a single discrimination of any kind, regardless of what the West says to you. This is our deen. We have thousands of Islamic scholars who are females, who used to teach, great scholar. This book here, this book, the one that we mentioned, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he says, one of my greatest teachers in hadith was a lady, was a woman teacher. So the first group is the ulama that Allah loves. Second group are the seekers of knowledge, the students. Seekers of knowledge, inshallah, Allahumma ja'alna minhum ya Rabbil You saved. Third group, he says, those people who facilitate their learning, they pay for expenses. They say they set up the school, they run the school, they can't teach. He says, look, I am a plumber, I have money. Here, I pay for this one, I sponsor this one, I sponsor this one. They use their money, they use their money for the teaching of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Third group, also loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fourth one, the muhibban, the people who love those people, sympathizers. They said, I can't be an alim, I don't have any children to give for knowledge. And I don't have any money to spend in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like my third brother is doing. But I love all those ulama. I love all those students of knowledge. I love my deen. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, you're saved, four of you. Don't be of the fifth one. Because the fifth one is the enemy for those four. Because you can't be anything else. You are infested by, by hubbud dunya, love of this dunya. You can't stand the company of the Islamic scholars. All the people who are muttaqi, that you fight and you, you, you defame them, you disparage them, you constantly speak ill about them behind their backs, and you set up a system to help people to demoralize these people. Okay? So when you have the power, when you allow, when you do not support these four groups of people, that means you are supporting anything other than these four groups of people. Therefore, you fall into that particular group of people. He who oppressively uses his power to elevate those whom Allah has brought low and to bring low those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has elevated. And the next one, the, the fourth one, 
who publicly disobeys Allah's commandments. We call this a person a fasiq. He drinks alcohol in the open. He says, I don't care. Everybody knows that what kind of person I am. Regardless, there is a rule in Islam. I'm not asking you to sin. But if you were to sin, you cannot do it publicly. Not in front of others. It's haram to show your sin or to share your sin with anybody. Oh, bro, brother, last night I was so terrible, I went and drank. Why are you telling me? Why are you telling me? Brother, I was in terms of, in terms of weakness, what? Oh, this, is a, this, is a, this is a confession box? There is no such thing. You don't go and talk to the Imam. Yeah, Imam, please, please. What? What have you done? No, there is no such thing. That sin was between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't tell me anything. It's haram for you to disclose that sin. Because sins are contagious. If they see this strong person falling into haram, what's the chance of this young man not saying, if that man, mashallah, who went to hajj last year, doing these things, I'm just a little young man, I mean, I do the haram stuff, so it's okay, for, must be okay for me. Being a bad example. Therefore, a person who does haram, don't show it to anybody. It's between, there is a chance that Allah SWT will forgive you. But if you become a bad example in the community, some Muslims, silly Muslims, young people come and talk to me about this one. They say, why should I be ashamed of uh, you know, who I am? I, I know that I'm bad, so I'm not ashamed of doing it in front of people. Everybody knows. No, this is, even, this is haram. You can't say this. Okay, you're bad. Okay, keep it to yourself. I don't want to know that you're bad. Keep it to yourself, not in front of people. It says, I don't want to be that, I don't, I don't want to have a double standard. In my heart, you know, you know. What do you mean? You're a Muslim. You're a sinful Muslim. But you can't say this. Not allowed to. A person who publicly sins is called a fasiq in Islam. Fasiq. The worst type of Muslim. After this, you're the rock bottom. Believe me. You are holding on to your iman with a thread. The weakest lamp is your iman. Rasulullah talks about the qulub, different types of hearts. He says, an open heart. There are four types of hearts, he says. An open heart, a closed heart, upside down heart, an oscillating heart, turning heart. He says, the open heart is the heart of a mu'min. Reflects asma'ullah al-husna. Reflects everything. His iman is mashallah, like a noor, transparent. Closed heart is the heart of a kafir. So dark. Doesn't take any light in or doesn't let anything out. Heart of a kafir. He says, upside down heart is the heart of a munafiq. He says, there is something wrong with this one. In other words, he looks Muslim from outside, but inside is a kafir. Absolutely weird stuff. Nifaq is amazing. He says the last one is the oscillating heart, the one that you're going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, is the heart of a Fasiq Muslim. He says depending on when he's caught, how he's caught, in what state he's caught, whether he was down, in other words he's sinning, if Malakul Mulk comes to him and grabs him at that state, he's gone. Or he was made tawbah, he was feeling a little bit good. <laughs> Malakul Mulk got him there, because his ajal came at that time, he made it. Because when you are sinning, when you're drinking alcohol, when you're committing zina, Rasulullah says, your iman just leaves you, elevate, it, it, it just hovers above you. When you are in that state of sinning, can you imagine dying as a drunk person? What's the chances of you being, going with the shahada when you're drunk? Or you're committing zina, you had a heart attack right in the middle of it. What's the chances of you saying the shahada? You're doing the haram stuff, you won't even remember. Yeah, oscillating heart. Hafidhan Allah Fasiq is a person who openly sins unashamedly. Jahil, ignorant Muslim. Above this is a salih Muslim. Good Muslim. Sadiq Muslim. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to these good Muslims in three categories. Four. Nabiyin, Siddiqeen, Shuhada, wa Salihin. These are the accepted ones. Nabiyin, Anbiya. Siddiqeen, those who are sadiq, loyal, champions of truth. Shuhada, the martyrs. And Salihin is the sadiq, good Muslims. Anything other than this is the fasiq. Is playing with fire. Our uh, ulama tell us this iman of us is of two types. One is a gift from Allah. Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you. And the other one is a borrowed one. He's giving you on rent. Because this iman, this hidayah, is the key access code to Jannah. Access code to Jannah. Malaika will be waiting at the door of entry into the barzakh before you leave this world. They will ask you, excuse me, sir, you have got something of ours. Can we have it back? What are you talking about? Your, that, Im- that Iman you did not take care of doesn't belong to you. Give it back to us. And therefore the person will die without Iman. <laughs> Some people, as a gift Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives, they know the value of it. They will not just label Muslims, nominal Muslims, because they're born into a Muslim family, and therefore they take things for granted. A Muslim who really works on his Iman, his Ibadah, his Ita'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knows the value of his Iman. And the greatest fear in his life is that loss of that Iman. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, the greatest fear of a Muslim is to fall back to kufr or shirk, whatever he was before. Na'udhu billah. So the other one, like uh, sometimes I give the example, if you have borrowed some... DVD or something from some video library or from your local library after a certain time when the time of expiry comes a month or so they give you a call excuse me sir you've got something of ours we need it back yeah you need to return I don't have it other day you have to pay fine whatever the the case is yeah blockbusters video whatever that place is they take that thing from you they will not let you pass. So Iman is something that you need to cherish, you need to look after. Al-Imanu Uriyan in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says. Iman is naked. Absolutely. Libasuhu at-taqwa. Correct? There are four things Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mentions, which I'm not going to go into. You need to look after your Iman. You need to protect this Iman. If you don't, if you take it for granted, you're a fasiq. And you do unashamedly sin in front of public, you're a fasiq. Then Rasulullah Wasallam says, May Allah curse that person. Because he's been a bad example to the community. Fifthly, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, He who makes lawful halal, that which is already haram. We mentioned about this before. I went and visited one particular lady in the role some mental hospital used to be in Royal Park I looked at her she looks normal but she ended up in she just came a couple of uh, days before and she doesn't want to see any doctor she says she wants to see an imam and she's because she speaks Turkish they called me for it I went I said, yes, sister. She's not hijabi or anything. Why are you here? She says something to me. I never forget. She says, I come from such and such city, from Turkey. And my family is well-off people. We're socialites. You know, elite. You know, we're modern Muslims. Oh, yeah. He says, it's a common thing for us to have lots of parties in our house, on our gatherings, and we always drink. Alcohol is part and parcel of our lives, like the Western society. As soon as in the movies you see, as soon as they come inside your house, they say, what are you drinking? What, do you have to drink? Yeah, what do you drink? They give you some haram, not a haram. Okay? He says, this is such a common thing amongst us. He says, but I'm beginning to have this particular feelings at the moment that I can explain. I said, what feelings? 
She says, when I was a baby, I had a nanny to look after me. This nanny was a very practicing Muslim from the village, good akhlaq, and she was muhajjiba, and she used to pray five times a day, and she used to be a very good person, and I loved her. She taught me one thing when I was a baby. Anything and everything I say, begin with, must start with Bismillah. Bismillah rahman rahim Bismillah rahman rahim I don't even know the meaning of Bismillah rahman rahim she says. But I kept on saying, Bismillah rahman rahim Bismillah rahman rahim Bismillah rahman rahim Eating, Bismillah rahman rahim Sleeping, Bismillah rahman rahim Normal Muslim life. Says then I grew up, I went to school, primary school, high school, and my nanny is gone, of course. Then I became and joined my father's business and everything else. We're having cocktail parties. Then each time now, he says, every now and then, every now and then, I take alcohol in my hand just involuntarily, without even realizing. Before I put the drink into my haram, into my mouth, I say, Bismillah rahman rahim Then after that, I begin to get the shakes. I begin to see things, I begin to feel things. Bismillah rahman rahim I said, your problem is a serious problem. She says, what is the problem? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this khamr, what you're drinking, absolutely haram. When you say Bismillah rahman rahim upon something, you're trying to make that haram into halal. Haram into halal. Nobody has the authority to do this. If anybody who deliberately does this, turns haram into halal, or halal into haram for that matter, according to our religion, becomes a kafir, non-believer. For example, something that I give you, not an alcohol example, if a person deliberately, knowingly, intentionally, prays without wudu, according to four madah, he becomes a kafir. You feel lazy, oh, I don't want to pray, <laughs> they're praying, Allahu Akbar. You go wudu? <laughs> My little one used to say, Ya go wudu, when? Yesterday, last night I took one. Yeah, we laugh, yeah, 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 sure, sure. Because it's a baby, not a problem. But the guy is 18 years old, the guy is 25 years old. Hey, Allahu Akbar. You don't have wudu, there is no salat. And you think that you prayed? No. Because you, Allah made it fard upon a Muslim to make wudu before salat. Tahara before salat is fard. And you change the state. He says, no, don't worry, Allah, uh, it works for me. All right, uh, I change it into halal. Allahu Akbar. Don't worry, I had a shower yesterday. This is not a joking matter. So when a person who makes lawful, that is which is unlawful, or unlawful which is lawful, falls into this particular category. And finally, Rasulullah sallam says, He who leaves my sunnah, abandons my sunnah. May Allah's curse be upon that such person. Sunnah, in this regard, sunnah is the interpretation of the Qur'an. Living example of the Qur'an. Sunnah is the other side of the coin. You cannot separate Qur'an from sunnah. Sunnah, Islam we say, what is the definition of Islam? Islam in big words, Islam is what is enunciated in the Qur'an and what is exemplified in the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa That's what Islam is. They are like, La ilaha illallah Muhammad rasulullah You cannot separate them from one another. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, He who abandons my sunnah, he is not one of me. He is not one of me. Sunnah, especially, mutawatir sunnah, sahih sunnah, absolutely established mu'akkad sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa If you abandon this, you're playing with fire. You play with fire, especially it go take, will take you into kufr, na'udhu billah, if you belittle the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you mock the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What's this man? What's this man on your face? What's this man? What's this? Get rid, get rid of it. Why? This is the sunnah. I know it doesn't look good on me, but I do it for the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Get the vegetation off your face. Looks ugly. Be a clean shaven, pure, you know, clean. What do you think, I'm dirty? I took a shower five minutes ago. I come and I look after it. Uh, uh, it's no good, man. Go. We, we don't live in the uh, what do you call 14 years ago. 
We in the modern times, get rid of it, get rid of it. No good, no good. But Rasulullah Sallallahu had it. Don't, doesn't matter, he was, he was old. You just change it. You just lost your deen. You make fun with hijab? You make fun with any of the shi'arul Islam? Any of the symbols of Islam? It amounts to af'alul kufur or al-fadhul kufur. You need to be extremely careful. You can't make fun of with the sunnah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But there are some mustahabs, which, which is maybe sunnah, maybe not sunnah. Maybe we will not take you outside of Islam. But if it's a mutawatir sunnah, if it's a mu'akkad sunnah, established sunnah, and you deliberately know this, and you go against it, then you fall into this danger. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, you're not one of me. And may Allah's, Allah, Allah's curse and anbiya, my curse, curses upon that person, he says. Then after having said this, just to summarize, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says there are six types of people whom I have cursed and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has cursed. For the dua of every anbiya, Prophet of Allah is accepted. What are they? First, the one who adds anything or takes away from the book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He who disbelieves in the qadr of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He who oppressively uses his political power, his position to elevate those whom Allah has brought low and to bring low those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated. Next one, those who publicly disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the fasiqeen. And fifth one, those who make lawful what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already made unlawful. And the sixth one, those people who abandon my sunnah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, may Allah's curse be upon those people. And the hadith concludes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at them on the day of judgment in a merciful manner. Nazarul Rahma, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah allow us to increase our ilman nafi'ah, beneficial knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us yaqeen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our ibadah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our ikhlas. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our a'mal al-saliha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our iman. Make our iman qawi inshallah. Make our Islamic personality strong, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify our hearts. May allow us to achieve that tazkiyah to nafs, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to get rid of all the akhlaq al razila the blameworthy attributes from our hearts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates, and bring all the akhlaq al hamida praiseworthy attributes that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to have into our hearts, into our, into our, into our hearts that inshallah which will drive our behavior, which will control our behavior. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy and rahmah upon all the Muslimin. Allahumma aslih ummata Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma arham ummata Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma tajawaz an ummati Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma ja'alna min ummati Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma arham أمة محمد رحمة عامة يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا وقلبا خاشعا ولسانا ذاكرا وشاكرا وتوبة نصوحا اللهم اجعلنا من التوابين واجعلنا من المتطهرين واجعلنا من عبادك الصالحين واجعلنا من الذين لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون يا رب العالمين ارحمنا يا أرحم الراحمين ارحمنا يا ذا الجلال والإكرام ارحمنا يا رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صدق الله العظيم سبحانك اللهم وحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت واحتك لا شريك لك نستغفرك ونتوب إليك لله تعالى الفاتحة